Um, so, just I don't know if anybody realizes this, but I began my career at in the Washington Post, working uh, on digital issues, which at the time was called online services. And Steve Case is the very first person I met in this area, and the very first person I wrote two books about. That's right. Um, so we've been talking and arguing for 25 years now and about where. And continue it's, today. And continue today. And I'm going to begin by talking about uh, asking you some questions because. One of my least favorite things to do is admit you're right, um, and and you have been I right. I hope this is being recorded. So yeah, okay. uh, your your recent book, which you wrote two years ago, and we did came a out last year. Yeah, right, was called the third wave. Explain the third wave, and I want to talk about why you've been very prescient about the election and how people are about jobs and global change in in the tech atmosphere. So why don't you talk about first? Well, to set up the third wave, the, the first wave of the internet was getting everybody online. When we started AOL well, 32 years ago, as you know, less than 1% of the world was online, less than 3% of America was online. And so we really needed to build those on ramps. And obviously many companies were, were part of that first wave, getting everybody connected. That set the stage for the last 15 or 20 years, the second wave, which really been about software and apps on top of the internet, right. Facebook and Google and, and so forth, obviously been dominant. The third wave is the next logical step for the internet, which is really integrating it in seamless and pervasive ways throughout our lives. And the process is really changing, finally, things like healthcare and agriculture and smart cities and a lot of things that are going to happen. Transportation, you know, Big, big, big uh, energy, a lot of big things are, are happening, some of which happened, a little bit of which happened in the first wave, a little bit more in the second wave. But the third wave is when the internet really meets kind of everyday life and some of these critical aspects of our lives and some of the largest industries in the, in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the world are going to get really disrupted. Right. One of the things you talked about in the book was how important it was for, the, for Silicon Valley and tech to engage with the government right. um, and, and regulatory bodies across the world. And it was, it was somewhat made fun of in Silicon Valley, the idea that cooperation was something that they needed to do because they had been so successful up to this point, largely avoiding those relationships. Yeah, well, the internet itself uh, was a product of US government investment in basic research through an agency mm -hmm. called DARPA that actually helped fund the creation of, of the internet. And then there were some policies decisions, including breaking up Ma Bell, AT&T, mm -hmm. uh, more than three decades ago, that really set the stage for competition in, in communications, and then the Communications Act. When we first started uh, AOL in 1985, it was still illegal for consumers or businesses to connect to the internet. It was right. restricted to educational institutions, government institutions. So policy played a critical role in the, in the first wave in unleashing the internet. It wasn't that critical in the, in the, in the second mm -hmm. wave when it was just about software, but it will become critical again because the sectors that are going to get disrupted, like healthcare, are regulated. Now, you can debate what the regulation should be, but there is some regulation around drug safety and right. medical devices, You, had, you ran like into that. quite a buzzsaw around uh, content uh, yeah. when they were, had the community Communications Decency right. Act in the United States and stuff like that, but it was largely around pornography and and child, all kinds of things protecting children, but yeah, nothing it was else. How, how in that first wave, how do you get everybody the benefits of the internet, but also try to minimize, mitigate, hedge some of the downside risk, in terms, including making it safe for kids? So, what, as I said, tech didn't like dealing with. That was one of their that was one of their more famous things that they didn't want to deal with the government. They made it a big uh, you were never really like that, but most people there were like, we don't want to talk to the government. Why should we do it? We're better than the government. We don't need the government. We are the government. Um, yeah, uh, there's innovators, entrepreneurs want to move quickly. They want to, they don't want to be slowed down. So there, it's not surprising that the idea of government involvement and regulations and things like that frustrate you know, people because it does slow down some of the innovation. At the same time, when you're entering this new you know, sphere with some of these things like smart cities, huge benefits in terms of, of uh, how it can improve how cities work and how people move around and, and you know, managing energy, all kinds of things. But of course, there's some policy implications around cybersecurity and privacy and, and things like that. So I think the entrepreneurs, the innovators in this third wave just need to understand that while sometimes it might be frustrating to have to deal with some of these regulatory issues, it's part of the game in that, in that third wave. It's not just about the software, it's how you get it integrated into society, and it's also about partnerships. You right. increasingly need to figure out ways to create a 
network around your idea with strategic partnership with other companies, other organizations, whether it be healthcare or smart cities or other. You can't do it your own. It's not just creating except, an app and dropping it in the app store and hoping you'll be successful. They've largely, they largely ignored you in that part and have gotten into all kinds of trouble recently, mm -hmm. one around the social networks with Congress, uh, it was just, uh, we just wrote yesterday on Recode and others wrote about that Marissa Mayer is being called, to, subpoenaed by Congress yeah. about the breaches, Equifax, the same thing. Um, there's uh, all sorts of populism, the, the rise of Trump has, uh, does, reflects the anger at tech and a, a job replacement. Right. And we're going to talk about that in a second, about what you do in that area. Um, have they gotten the message? I mean, I had asked, I'm not going to ask you this question. I, I, actually, I'd be curious. I've asked the last two people I've interviewed, how, how fucked is tech in this, in this new era? And, you know, someone actually tweeted at me, you know, one, not fucked at all, two, somewhat fucked, three, really fucked, four, beyond fucked, which I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, but where do you put them? What, where do you put it now, and what can they do to assuage the situation? Because it just seems to get worse. And then Uber, obviously. Jeff's stuff is really cool, but most of Uber's history has been, and now it come, came crashing in on it because of its disdain for regulatory niceties. Yeah, and no, I think uh, there is a backlash brewing against uh, big tech and particularly against uh, Silicon Valley. It's, it's already started in Europe first in, in Brussels. Yeah. It's now increasing in Washington, D.C. I think it's not that surprising because of the, the role these companies are playing and the impact they have in, in so many different ways. But I also think in some ways Silicon Valley has been a little tone deaf. They were disconnected from the reality where a lot of people in a lot of parts of the country did feel left out and did feel mm -hmm. left behind by digitization, globalization, and, and people up until recently weren't really paying attention to that. That's beginning to Why to, to weren't change. they? I'm going to interject. Why weren't they paying attention? I think it, you know, they, they would say they're busy doing innovative things and they, they're, they have their you know, heads down trying to, trying to innovate, but also they have, like in Silicon Valley, it's a great place and obviously will continue to be super innovative, but in Washington, D.C., where I live, we, people talk about inside the beltway, kind of. You, if you get out of touch with what's happening in the middle of the country. I think there's a inside Silicon Valley kind of, you know, kind of dynamic as well, and people need to get out and see what's happening in other parts of the country or other parts of the, the world to really understand how people feel and, and what they can do to make sure people feel optimistic about the future. There are many people that are scared about AI, scared about robotics, scared about driverless right. trucks, what, what impact it will have on jobs and things like that. How do we make sure people are optimistic about the future, not, not, not skeptical or even maybe, well, maybe hostile? Not to sound like a Luddite, but why would you be optimistic? I mean, today the head of Deutsche Bank talked about eliminating half its jobs. And, and one of the things you know I've been talking about with you a lot lately is these issues around AI, automation, robotics, uh, self-driving, right. which is a whole panoply of jobs, um, and, and, and the general move away from jobs, that, there, that a lot of jobs are repetitive and can be digitized. Um, and so why, do, I, what I want to get at is, because you've had such an insight into these figures, what they, what's the problem? Because I think they have no ability to understand their responsibility, nor do they care. I, I, I get to the point where it's willfully ignorance over their impact of their inventions, but you may not agree no, with that. No, I me. think that's probably a little, little strong. I think they've been you know, a little disconnected from the reality out there, and as a result, and then we saw this in, in, uh, in, in 10 years ago, Wall Street kind of became the, you know, the bad guy. I think Silicon Valley is starting to emerge as that. But there's still time to change that. I, I applaud some of the moves. I was in did another of these Rise of the Rest road trips yeah. a few weeks ago, when we were at cities like uh, you know, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, Indiana. And, and that same day we were in Ann Arbor, Google announced they were opening something in Detroit, creating six or 700 jobs there. So having the Silicon Valley companies demonstrate they care about the rest of the country, care about the rest of the world, trying to create jobs, backing entrepreneurs there because the startups are the big job creators. Like, that can change the, the narrative, but I think they, they're kind of going to find themselves in the penalty box for a little while because they were a little out of touch uh, with the reality of how people were thinking about their So, their, their talk innovations. about the, the rise of the rest. This is a thing you're doing. Um, part of it is seen, it's been manifesting in Silicon Valley, at least, by them visiting the real people. Right. The, they even use it. You know, they are real people who are visiting the real people. But you know, Mark Zuckerberg going around and petting livestock all over the United States, or uh, someone was on a car trip where he says, "I'm going to go talk to people in diners," as if that's where the wisdom resides in the United States. Um, and it seems a little bit pandering to me. You know, the idea of I will now go see the the simple folk. You know, I'll come down from my jet planes and. 
a homemade kombucha and go see the simple folk. You know what I mean? Like it does. It feels no, like I think stop. I think it is helpful to get out. So I applaud anybody who's trying to understand this. But some of you just look at the data that essentially all job creation comes from startups. Right. And last year in the United States, 75 percent of venture capital went to three states. Right. California, New York and Massachusetts. California alone got 50 percent. So some of the states I was in recently, like Ohio or Pennsylvania, they got one percent. So mm -hmm. a, st a big state like Ohio gets in a year what California gets in a week in terms of venture capital. And that goes back to your jobs question. If we're only backing the entrepreneurs in a few places like Silicon Valley right. that are doing disruptive things that destroy jobs in other places, and we're not offsetting that, at least in part, by backing the entrepreneurs in those other places, no wonder people in these places are feeling frustrated and feeling left behind. So getting more venture capital to backing more startups in more parts of the country, more parts of the world is a way to to address this and getting people connected to what's happening in those communities how, is critical. How then do you, though, build, there is something to be said for this analog iron triangle of a university like Stanford or Berkeley, uh, the venture capitalists and the entrepreneurs in one place. It does create an analog strong community and it's, it's hard to replicate it anywhere. They have Silicon Desert, they've got Silicon this, Silicon that, but it's not the same thing. Well, it's not the same thing, but these, there's an arc to this. That, that, that what people in the United States call the Rust Belt was essentially the startup belt of the Industrial of Revolution. And then and, it wasn't. And, and then and lost its way when the Industrial Revolution kind of led the way with the Technology Revolution. But 75 years ago, Silicon Valley was fruit orchards. Right. The cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh were the leading innovative right. cities. So these things e e evolve over time. But some of these cities, like in Ann Arbor, that's where Larry Page went to, you know, to right. school in Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, great schools in, in Pittsburgh, like Carnegie Mellon. That's why Google and Uber and others now have operations in, in Pittsburgh. So there's a lot of talent there, a lot of great universities there. There's just been a brain drain where people felt because all the money is in, on the coast, they needed to go there if they wanted to innovate. That's beginning to change, and hopefully over the next decade, we'll have a more inclusive innovation economy and people can decide where they want to start a company or raise their family, not feel like they have to go somewhere in order to have real opportunity. Now you brought on J.D. Vance, who right. wrote the uh, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, right. which was a, had a lot of impact right. uh, around the United States. What was the point, and he moved to Ohio, right. and what, were you, what are you trying to do there with? Just accelerate with what we're doing with this rise of the rest. It's really, uh, you know, started as an idea, and now it's more of a, almost a movement. How do you, you know, kind of tell the story of these entrepreneurs in these other places, attract more media attention, attract more investor attention so more companies can start and more companies can scale and more jobs can be created mm -hmm. in more of these places. And JD, because of the success of Hillbilly Elegy that it sold two million copies you know, so far, it was a huge, huge bestseller, kind of really told the story of a lot of people who felt left behind. And mm -hmm. so having him join our, our, our effort has been terrific. So I want to finish up talking a little bit about where jobs are going because sure. you know this has been a big, it's an interest of mine where yeah. they're going. I have a theory, it's not a theory, it's just there's the top 10% of, and I'm just going to use the United States, but you could replicate this around the globe, top percent of the population loves the future, the top 1% is benefiting obscenely right. from it, essentially. The bottom 10% is not, and will almost never will, the education is, mm. is subpar, there, the prospects, there's opioid emidem, all right. kinds of terrible social problems. Um, in this group. And then in the middle, there's everybody else who are fearful of the future, but also know the future is important to understand the technological changes. Why hasn't this group pulled up this? What, what, what could happen where that occurs? Because it does feel like you're getting just the way you're getting the divisiveness in the United States around politics. It's the same thing, that there's going to be this group that is going to be permanent upper class. Well, I'm not sure. It's, it's certainly not it doesn't have to be permanent, but there is a divide. There's no question. We have a political divide and we have an innovation divide. And it does go back, I think, in large part to this venture capital question. If you're only backing startups in a few places, uh, you're, you know, there are going to be people who feel frustrated and left behind. But the jobs issue, it's not a new issue, technology disrupting jobs. 200 years ago, over 90% of us worked on farms. Right. Well, it's less than 2%. I've noticed. So, so the, the, the basically technology made farming much more efficient and essentially all the jobs in that market you know, went, kind away. Of, uh, went away. New jobs were created by the Industrial Revolution. Right. And so what the question is not are jobs going to be lost due to technology. Of course they are. It's going to be what new jobs are so we creating. So what new jobs? Because cause Mark Andreessen makes this argument, and we have had a large argument. That took 70 years, and there was enormous political upheaval and unrest during that period. This is going to take 20 years. 
And there's going to be much more jobs, millions and millions of jobs. We're already in the middle of huge political unrest, at least in the United States and elsewhere. E everywhere in the so world. So how, how do you, where are those jobs? Because they say, oh, it's going to replace. And so every time I talk to a Silicon Valley person, when they talk about artificial intelligence or anything else, it's, it's a happy, shiny future. And I keep thinking for you, but what about the doctor that loses their job? Because these are, re these are high paying jobs that are at risk, not farming jobs, not, you, it, what, what jobs do you think will be created? And everyone goes, well, they'll be created, and then they don't give me a specific well, the, the, concept. Well, I think there's two, two views I hear on this issue. One is sort of this sort of negative, almost dystopian view of a jobless future, and, and yeah. you know, we're going to you know, have to figure out a new social safety net, universal basic income, kind of almost, you know, there's no, no hope of, of job creation. The other, which tends to be maybe overly optimistic, almost utopian, that you know, it's always happened, that, you know, technology once again will, will figure out a way forward. I think the truth probably is somewhere in the middle. I think this time it may be a little bit different, mm -hmm. but if you're investing in more people in more places, you won't just create interesting companies, you'll create interesting industries. As you know, the internet, which we now take for granted, when we got started, most people didn't think it was a good idea. No, it's just you and me. Most people didn't think, wanted, why would us. anybody want to get online? Why would anybody yeah. type a message? Why wouldn't mm -hmm. they just you know, pick up the phone and, and call? Which now seems crazy, but in most of the 80s and most of the 90s, the general view was that would never take off, that will never be an industry. So what are the industries like the internet? So what like are they? I internet? want a specific, because I never can get a specific out of anyone. Healthcare is going to be transformed in very significant ways. Job creation. Some jobs will be destroyed, and some jobs will be created. So our artificial intelligence, how do you use that to augment the healthcare system and healthcare uh, professionals? That's, that's one example. There are many examples in different aspects of our lives where jobs can be created, but not if we're only investing in certain kinds of entrepreneurs in certain kind of places doing certain kind of things. There's, it's not surprising to me that the big innovations in things like uh, uh, mobile payments have been places like Kenya, mm -hmm. where they didn't have a banking system. That was a problem an right. entrepreneur saw, or some of the innovations in healthcare in rural villages in India where they don't have a healthcare system. You have to be close to the problem if, to, to see a potential opportunity, right. a potential solution. So we have to be, do a little less of backing the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and a little more right. of backing the entrepreneurs in the no, middle of the country I, or all around the I, world. I get it. You know, my big joke is uh, because of the way they develop systems in, in Silicon Valley, I call it assisted living for millennials mm -hmm. because it's yeah. let's have laundry, let's have, let's have delivery of laundry, delivery of food, delivery of whatever they want, because they're a bunch of kids that want things easily. How do you get that mindset elsewhere of more serious issue, more serious Well, I think solutions. it's beginning to change. And, 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 and a lot of the innovation in these rise the rest cities in the middle of the country, and a lot of the innovations I see traveling around the world, people are trying to take on some of these tougher challenges around So give me healthcare. one example. Like what's something that's a, that I would consider a serious like problem that solves it? Like Healthcare, a company we backed in Chicago called uh, Tempest, one of the founders of, of uh, Groupon, Eric Lefkowski started a company trying to essentially create like an operating system for cancer. Right now, if you, in the United States, States, you go to most hospitals, there's a good chance you'll get a misdiagnosis. MD Anderson in Texas, uh, which is one of the best uh, cancer hospitals in, in the country, says when people come there for a second opinion, 25% of the time they reverse the original opinion. Mm -hmm. That's a data problem. It's a diagnosis you know, problem. Right. And so that's an example where technology can be, and big data can present more precise diagnoses that lead to more precision you know, medicine. So that can change, transform healthcare as, a, as an industry, save people's lives. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, pretty fundamental that, you know, and, there, and more and more attention is now going to sectors like that, what I call these third wave uh, sectors. So I'm optimistic that there'll be innovations in our lives, innovations in these industries. It's going to require a different kind of entrepreneur, though, mm -hmm. that recognizes that, that these partnerships are more important and how do you form those partnerships around right. your idea. Policy is more important. How do you be more respective, respectful of the role of, of, of policy and regulators and, 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 and so forth. If you have that mindset, if it, and there's an African proverb I love that I think will just sort of define the third wave. If you want to go quickly, you can go alone, mm -hmm. but if you want to go far, you must go together. Mm -hmm. That's the spirit of the entrepreneurs in, in the third wave. All right, last quick question. You, you and I have been together a long time, and we, you made a lot of predictions back, uh, back 25 years ago, and mostly he, you were sitting in an office by yourself making these predictions. And I, <laughs> I thought you were kind of crazy at the time, but you've turned out to be relatively accurate. Um, give me one, if you could wave your on one prediction you would like to happen. 
Like for the rest of the rise, I, I, to have this more evenly dispersed innovation economy. So 10 years from now, instead of 75% of venture tech capital going to three states, it's more broadly you know, distributed and, and that you know, there's a, uh, an innovation happening everywhere, job creation happening everywhere. And obviously my focus is on the United States, but having that view of the world more broadly, how do you create even stronger startup communities in, in, in countries in, in Africa that really give you know, people more of hope and shifts the mindset in Africa that historically is around aid, kind of solving a problem, the investment kind of seizing the, the opportunity. So I think we're seeing the regionalization and globalization of entrepreneurship. I think that's a healthy thing. How do we accelerate that and back more entrepreneurs in more places more quickly and sort of level the playing field so everybody everywhere really feels like they have a shot at changing the world? Well, I like that. I thought you were going to say jetpack. But anyways, <laughs> everybody, Steve Case. Thank you, Thank Kara. You. Thank you all.